Dear Rector, distinguished members of other universities in Poland, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to speak at the World Copernican Conference on the occasion of 550 years since the birth of Copernicus and to celebrate the great Copernican revolution that forced realization of where we are in the solar system to the displeasure of some at the time, but edification of all now. I like to think of the Copernican revolution as the Copernican advance in science because Copernicus cast off some useless ideas, introduced some new ones, and of course built his great theory on much of what came before. This is how natural science grows. I can speak with some authority about this because I have led another great advance in national science, the demonstration that our universe is not per permanent. That's a remarkable discovery, of course, and uh, another revolution, but also just another advance. Uh, we must live, learn to live with the fact that our universe is not forever and we are not even at the center of the solar system. Conditions in society and science in Copernicus's time surely were very different from now. But uh, I see broad similarities. Both advances were based on a theory. Copernicus had a theory. We have a theory for the solar system. Uh, both required uh, specification of parameters and initial conditions that allowed one to compute and predict where the planets would be quite well. Um, Copernicus had re good reason to be confident in his re revolution in his advance uh, because it seemed to him, and it now seems very clear to us, that it places the planets in a far more rational order and it introduces an elegant relation that the further away the planet, the longer the period, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, the longer the period. Uh, I, m I must remember myself, I was uh, beginning very uneasy about looking into the thought that the universe is evolving and that it might be described by Einstein's general theory of relativity because at the time, uh, Einstein's theory had not been well tested. The situation very serious, very different now. But at the time, I didn't know whether I should trust the extrapolation of that theory to the immense scales of the universe. And uh, um, I remember that, uh, you know, I'm not used to speaking from printed text, so I will somewhat be extemporaneous. I remember my colleagues at Princeton University uh, uh, did not object to my studying the notion that the universe is evolving, but I had a distinct feeling they felt that it was better me than them. Uh, yeah. but, but in fact, uh, we now have a remarkably broad array of data that satisfies the predictions of the theory of the evolving universe according to general relativity in quite remarkable detail. There can be no question that uh, this theory is a good approximation to reality. But we should bear in mind always, it's an approximation. You know, all of our physical theories, the best tested of them are approximations in the sense that if pushed too far in odd directions, they will fail. That does not mean they are wrong. It means they are approximations. And it means there is remarkably broad areas for young scientists to come forward and show us how to make these theories even better. Uh, I remind you now, uh, but some, some of you at least, sociologists need not apply, William Ogburn and Dorothy Thomas gave us a list of uh, an interesting phenomenon the odds are when a, an idea starts to circulate in the community, the odds are pretty good that the idea had previously been proposed and uh, not noticed. Uh, they made an important point in that essay uh, by the, that is uh, represented in the title of their paper, Are Scientific Discoveries Inevitable? 
I offer an example. If Albert Einstein had decided to become a musician, uh, we would not be, it would not have been long before we had his special theory of relativity. Others were hot on the trail. It would take a longer time to get Einstein's general theory of relativity, but we now realize that in fact this theory is simply an elegant extrapolation of, 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 of Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. To get technical, technical for a moment, uh, I, Maxwell's theory is the simplest vector theory that conserves charge. Uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity is the simplest classical tensor theory that conserves local energy and momentum. It takes nothing away from Einstein to say that surely his great discoveries were inevitable, or at least very close to it. And it takes nothing from, Einstein, from Copernicus's wonderful advance to say that if he had been otherwise occupied, surely it would have been discovered that we do not live at the center of the solar system. My bet is Kepler, who, who made other great, also made great contributions, would have been the one to do it. Um, I noticed that this tendency of multiple discoveries has, at least in part, uh, a very simple explanation. We human beings love to, in, to communicate. I will use a common word for it. We love to gossip. Uh, we gossip in the hallways as we pass. We gossip when having coffee. We gossip, gossip at conferences. And you know, I feel that often the gossip is more important for what is not said than what is said. And from all of that, we are deducing what our colleagues are thinking. Colleagues travel, they exchange information. Again, we have hints to what they're thinking. These hints are passed from place to place until eventually uh, a version of the gossip happens to hear, approach, uh, reach a person who happens to be prepared to receive that gossip and act on it. Of course, it follows that more than one person can receive the gossip, many in slightly different forms, and uh, also act on it. Hence, the multiplicity of discoveries then and now, it's been certainly my experience through my career. Um, now, another related point. Um, when I began working on the notion of an expanding universe and the physics therein, I was a documented alien from Canada uh, in the USA. Uh, in Russia, Yakov Borisovich Zaldovich, who was born in Minsk and ended up in Russia, happened to be working on the same idea. We were working simultaneously. We didn't know that each was working on this subject until much later. Uh, it's not surprising that we both work <coughs> on similar directions because we were just following the physics. The big question is, why were we both thinking, thinking about a universe <coughs> that began hot and expanded and cooled, leaving behind fossils of what happened? Pardon me while I refresh my throat. So why were people thinking about a universe that began hot? Uh, a similar question could have been asked 500 years ago. Why was not only Copernicus, but others thinking that maybe, maybe the Earth rotates around the sun? Uh, again, it's important to say that does not take away from Copernicus. He took the great work of turning the idea into a theory. Uh, <clears throat> but the, th the idea was floating around. Similarly, the idea that the universe began hot had been floating around too. I remember <coughs> in the 1930s already, physicists were wondering where do the chemical elements come from? It was thought at the time that stars are not hot enough to have made them, and that the one place <coughs> that could have been hot enough would be during the early stages of expansion of the universe. Uh, the great scientist uh, Chandrasekhar in the early 1940s wrote much of the theory of how elements could form in the early, early universe when the universe was very hot. It takes nothing away from Chandrasekhar's great genius to notice. He failed to notice one thing, 
that uh, if the universe were hot, as he had postulated, it would inevitably be filled with thermal radiation. The radiation with an intensity at each wavelength that's determined by just one number, the temperature. As the universe expands, that temperature will drop, but the radiation won't go away. There's no place for it to go. In short, he did not recognize that the universe ought to, if it were expanded from a hot state, it ought now to be full of thermal radiation, a sea of radiation that has cooled by the expansion of the universe, but is still there. Where am I now? Ah. I'm, I failed to notice that Chandrasekhar came from Pakistan. I want to make a point, as I drone on about this, that uh, scientists come from all over the world. Where am I saying? Next, next George Gamov from Ukraine. Built on this idea, uh, Gamov was a great visionary, not a careful scientist, he was a visionary. But he made the important point, there would be another fossil from the early universe, much of the matter that comes out of the early universe would have about 30, 50%, he thought, helium, 50% hydrogen, and traces of the heavier elements. The, uh, the, the uh, 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 Enrico Fermi from Italy, uh, working with Anthony Turkovich, one of children of a Russian Orthodox priest, uh, checked the details, showed that Einstein, Gamov was right, that if the universe started hot, it would have two distinctive features. There would be a sea of thermal radiation, filling space almost exactly uniformly, and about a third of the, a third is what Fermi and Terkovich got, a third of the universe would be made of helium right from the beginning, the rest hydrogen, and in fact they've showed uh, you're not going to get the chem heavier chemical elements out of that hot big bang. Nevertheless, we had this key prediction. It's interesting that Zeldovich, uh, the Russian, thought that the early stars contained little helium and that uh, uh, if that were the case, then Gamov's prediction would be wrong. The universe did not evolve from a hot state. Uh, in fact, in the, in the USA, uh, Don Ant Osterbrook, Jack Richardson, 1961, wrote an essay uh, pointing out that the, the stars, in fact, contain a remarkably large amount of helium, something like 30%. Why are the stars so uniformly filled with so much helium? They pointed out that it could be the gamma theory. It could be that the universe evolved from a dense, hot state. Uh, here's an example of multiplicity. They presented the the evidence, the argument for a hot early universe, and left it at that. They had other things to do. And because they didn't publish in a very front, widely distributed uh, journal, uh, the community didn't notice. Here was a great discovery to be made, but overlooked. That's life. Ah, Zeldovich. A great tragedy. Zeldovich had made great contributions to the Soviet uh, nuclear weapons program. That gave him great honor in Russia and the USSR. It also made that he could not travel outside the country unless under strict control because he knew too much. If he had been able to get out of the country and talk to a knowledgeable astronomer such as Osterbrock or Rogerson, he would have seen directly that Gamma was not necessarily wrong. He had the ability and the colleagues to have completed the job of investigating the early implications of this th expanding universe theory. He it would have been Nobel Prize worthy work. Uh, to my mind, it's a terrible strategy. Zeldovich had a productive, wonderful life, but still it could have been better if he had been able to communicate. Communication, you see, is so important. Meanwhile, meanwhile, this is a complicated story of discovery continues. In the Bell Telephone Laboratories in New Jersey, some 30 miles, well, 50 kilometers uh, from us, there was research on communication by microwave radiation. It is, it is technology that gave you that cell phone, for better or worse. I do not like to see the students in our beautiful campus walking around looking at their cell phone. But they also had a great problem beginning in 1959. 
their, their receivers for these experiments with communication were receiving more radiation than they could account for. That was a dirty little secret at the Bell Laboratories for until 1964, when two young uh, physicists at that laboratory, Arnold Penzias, Bob Wilson, resolved to find the source of this radiation getting into the microwave receivers. They are recredited for refusing to give up the search for this radiation. The management at Bell Laboratories is to be credited for allowing them to continue to do this apparently useless work. And of course, it is important that Penzias and Wilson complained until someone heard them and told them to get in touch with the people at Princeton University, where Bob Dickey, who had invented much radio, much microwave technology during World War II as war research, had decided that the two of the young members of his group, David Wilkinson and Peter, radiometer to see if this radiation is actually present. It was a, a, a curiosity-driven, random experiment. Let these young people do it. Well, it's a wonderful discovery. If they don't detect radiation, they haven't much, lost much time and they've learned how to do some science. And he said very casually to me, why don't you go think about the theory, uh, impl implications of detection or absence of detection of this radiation. So uh, I have been through my entire career following Bob Dickey's advice. Um, to great delight. Uh, I don't know how Dickey knew. He didn't know that I would spend the rest of my life doing this, but somehow a great scientist will have intuition, and sometimes the intuition will lead in right directions. We have now per persuasive evidence that the universe is evolving. So I, I, I offer a, another example of the unexpected connections that are made in the pursuit of curiosity-driven research. Uh, in the 1970s, I developed a program of statistical analyses of the distributions and motions of the galaxies. I did not have a specific reason for doing this. I had instead the hope that if I made measurements of the distributions and motions of the galaxies, statistical measurements, uh, something might come of it that, is, that hints at how the galaxies formed and how they became distributed. But just a vague thought. Let's see what these statistics are. Let's see if it hints at anything. And let's see if that hints at the evolution of the universe. So um, uh, it happened, and I remember this event very well, that while I was doing this, Conrad Roditsky at the Yagelonian University in Krakow and colleagues we're compiling a catalog of positions of very distant galaxies in a useful sample of space. I didn't know that they were doing this, and I'm sure Conrad Ranitsky and colleagues did not know what I was doing. Here were two independent lines of research. Now, I remember well sitting in the library at the University of California, Berkeley, and noticing a thick paper. Uh, what is this? It, it was Rudnitsky and all's catalog. It happened to be just the data I needed to check that the statistical measures I was making were not seriously corrupted by systematic error. Those, the, 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 those results then offered me what I had intuitive might be the case. <clears throat> they taught us things. First, that gravity uh, is the main mechanism that causes the expanding universe to fragment into clumps of matter, the clumps we call galaxies of stars. Uh, that was an important advance, but of course, it's a common lesson in science. An advance in science will raise new questions. It happened in Copernicus's case. Uh, it happened here. Uh, still an ongoing, deeply rich problem is understanding how, how galaxies for, turn into the form they are and the arrangement of stars, gas, dust, black holes, wonderfully which problem people are still working on. Another result from that survey was the evidence of the mass density of the universe. Um, 
We had at the time the notion that the universe is evolving uh, according to Einstein's general theory of relativity. And we could see that this universe requires mass to make sense physically and of course to take account of the fact that we see mass. The, the theory allowed curvature of space sections of constant time. We didn't need that. And the theory allowed Einstein's cosmological constant. A term that Einstein deeply regretted adding to his theory once he recognized that the theory predicts the evolution of the universe. Uh, and that a uh, 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 this, this cosmological constant also is a deep mystery because it does not neatly fit into our detailed theory of elementary particles. Our fundamental theory is missing something deep to find a place for that cosmological constant, which almost surely is there. Uh, at the time, uh, the community, by and large, was content to say, we don't need the cosmological constant, we don't need space curvature. Uh, that required a definite mass density. Uh, but uh, the evidence I was finding, uh, backed up, of course, by the developing data, always data is driving theory, the evidence through Mark Davis and colleagues, uh, by our analysis, uh, pretty clearly showed the mass density is less than uh, the, the elegant value, and that we therefore need, if we trust general relativity, something yet to be added. The simplest of all is that cosmological constant. Uh, the result is now very clear. We have to learn to live with the cosmological constant. And we have a great challenge, great opportunity for research by coming generations. Show us why it's there and show, it how, show us how it fits into the rest of the evidence. Um, so in fact, now I, I have four summary lessons. First is that through my career, I have been conducting research that has very little chance of being monetizable, very little chance of being patentable to collect gains to make money. Curiosity-driven research certainly can turn into money. Uh, Einstein's, well, uh, quantum physics turns out to be a wonderfully successful theory. It makes some odd predictions. One of them, tangled states, where the nature of a particle here it depends on the nature of a particle here and the natures can communicate instantaneously. It's a bit bizarre, odd, spooky thing, as Einstein put it. That theory is now well tested uh, and the notion of, uh, of, of uh, entangled states, um, the most odd, odd of effects, surely, <coughs> surely simply curiosity-driven odd, oddity, surely of no some practical application. But of course now, vast amounts of money are being put into the notion of quantum, quantum computation with entangled states. Uh, my theory, I am convinced, will never get to such monetizable state. Uh, it caused me to reflect <clears throat> that during my time at Princeton University, the management has never asked me to consider doing something a little more useful. Uh, I must say that <laughs> this is something that we deeply value as academics. And uh, you, you know that, of course, if the universe had, uh, the university administration had ever approached me with the suggestion I do something more useful, I would have been astounded. It just is not done. And I think that it is not done because of the experience, the intuition that uh, curiosity-driven research is so important for its effect on the way we all think. I believe that we communicate, as I've indicated. I believe that when we notice that in one field, curiosity-driven research is doing something interesting, it influences other disciplines, other people who will also become more productive. I think that curiosity-driven research causes 
flowering of research and, and development in the arts as well as the sciences, it is immensely valuable. I might mention that it's my, where am I going on? All right, we made with the first lesson, second lesson. Uh, as you've seen examples, uh, when uh, research in natural science evolves in unexpected ways, and part of that is fortuitous merging of research that was conducted originally for very different reasons, but comes together to reinforce both lines of research. Uh, along with that, we are just driven to satisfy human curiosity. Uh, we have to remember that scientists are human. And they have all of the human foibles, the good and the bad, but certainly curiosity. Look at a young child, intensely curious. Where, the, where am I in this world? What is my function? Deep curiosity is part of human nature. Uh, it gets beaten out of some of us, of course, because we have other things more practical to worry about, but we deeply value curiosity. Curiosity driven, drives con human, um, so much of human endeavor. Uh, in fact, yes, I did mean to point out uh, industry creates knowledge and that knowledge can drive intellectual curiosity driven research. We have a direct example. Bell Telephone Laboratories develops the technology for a cell phone. That same technology was the first detection of a fossil from the early universe. Never planned, of course, a fortuitous development, but you want to keep open the lines of communication, the lines of research in both industry and university that makes this sort of thing happen. I like to mention CCDs, charge coupled devices. They were meant by industry to develop a telephone with a video system. Now, of course, that was a ridiculous notion. Who wants to wake up early in the morning, turn on, answer your phone, and have a video image projected? But in fact, that technology allowed the detector of light that is far more efficient than photographic plates. Now, CCC detectors and other means of detecting electromagnetic radiation at many wavelengths allow enormous collections of data of what's in the sky. Uh, you couldn't handle that data if you were still in the slide rule era, uh, but vast advances in computers uh, with a, a, the ability to handle this data, first, of course, to store it and then handle it and then interpret the results, have led to a dramatic advance in our understanding of the world around us, to remarkable advances in science and in the tests of our theory of the expanding universe. Oh, and, and now part of that theme, I'm in my third lesson, um, we agree that uh, if you have a specific problem, uh, find the nature of the dark matter, you will focus the research directly on it. But of course, you had better beware that uh, new ideas may come up and those new ideas may cause you to revise your plans. But even more important, I think it is <clears throat> that we not focus entirely on well-defined directions of research. Instead, it is deeply important that we allow for pure curiosity-driven research that may go nowhere or may lead to new directions that will further enrich our knowledge of the world around us and enrich our technology. After all, we have to base... Uh, it's the fact that we should pause to consider uh, our whole way of life is dominated by discoveries generated by pure curiosity-driven research. Fourth, <clears throat> I did forget to mention that uh, Maxwell gave us a theory of electromagnetism. Pure curiosity. Um, it is said that Faraday uh, was being inspected by the Queen of England the Queen said, well, that's all very well, Mr. Faraday, but what do you think will, what, what use is it? What use is it to investigate this electricity and these magnetism? Uh, Faraday is alleged to have responded, I do not know what will come of this 
research majesty, but I'm sure you will tax it. <laughs> so, um, we have seen examples of the, of the observation in my last lesson. A great advance in science will resolve problems, but it will inevitably raise new problems. Recall that uh, Copernicus resolved the problem. How do I understand the curious arrangement of the planets in the old Ptolemaic system? Uh, but a question, uh, what do, what do the, how, why do the planets move the way they do? Kepler, uh, in an age when magnetism was being studied with great intensity, tried to make out that perhaps, perhaps magnetism is causing the, the orb planets to move. Einstein, you know, had a better idea. Let's introduce a law of gravitation and apply it to a new, our new mechanics. That works wonderfully well, but of course Einstein showed how to do even better. Uh, gave us general relativity theory. That theory applied to the nature of the universe, gave us the evolving universe, and some really difficult problems. What was the universe doing before it was expanding? You will hear uh, notions, ideas, but you won't hear much uh, conviction apart from those who are in love with the theory uh, because we don't have much data on what happened before the universe was expanding. There are lots of other ideas of that sort. Um, we, let's not list them. Let's just recognize that we are leaving for the next generation a broad range of opportunities for research. Sometimes they're called challenges. I think we should be more positive. They are opportunities for the next generations of scientists, engineers, poets, authors, to improve the world around us by making great new advances in thought. The Polish people, I have been, I am aware, deeply value their freedom to shape their culture as they would and to, to allow curiosity-driven research as people are inclined to do. I think that love of freedom surely has contributed to the proud history of contributions by Poland, Polish citizens to the sciences and the arts, and they are, I'm sure, well prepared to continue in the same direction. Um, research already planned here and already in progress here in Poland on, for example, the new astronomy of gravitational wave detection. A great rule of experience in science is that you look at the world around you in a different way, you'll receive new questions. The ability now to detect gravitational waves has given us a new window into the universe and new puzzles to resolve activity going on here. There is a deep problem of understanding how dark matter and the cosmological constant of Einstein fit in research, uh, fit into our theoretical physics. Um, research in line here at Nicholas Copernicus University is, is addressing this problem. The Copernicus Academy will address it even further. There will be cooperation of Polish scientists with those around the world, and there will be great discoveries to be made. Why not coming from Poland? I think there's a great chance of that happening. And I wish you all the greatest adventure and to you and your students and the students of the students. There will be great discoveries to be made. Thank you.
Jego magnificencja rektor Andrzej Sokala wręczył profesorowi Biblesowi reprint dzieła Mikołaja Kopernika De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium.